is with great, great pleasure that I welcome to the stage uh, Justice Rosie Bella and the people who gave us this film. So please come on up. <laughs> I am Martha Minow. Uh, I'm so delighted to be with you today as we celebrate people. this remarkable film about an extraordinary person and how lucky we are to have Justice Abella here with the filmmakers. As you know, Justice Abella, if you sit here, that would be great. You, you sit here, mm -hmm. thank you. Hi, Martha. I'm nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Um, you, I'm not gonna repeat her biography, you just saw her biography, but I am going to say, just quote one thing that Justice Abella said in that landmark uh, report, the Royal Commission on Equality and Employment, uh, the commission that had one commissioner, whose name was Rosie Abella, uh, she said, the goal of equality is more than an evolutionary intolerance to adverse discrimination. It is to ensure, too, that the vestiges of these arbitrarily restrictive assumptions do not continue to play a role in our society. How lucky we are to have Justice Sabella, who is now the Samuel and Judith Pizar Visiting Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School, and her courses on equality, discrimination, human rights, the judiciary, and law and literature are engaging, fresh, and memorable. She is my cherished friend and a cherished friend of so many here. Uh, and how did this film come to happen? We're gonna hear from Barry Averich and producer Mark Selby. Welcome to Harvard Law School. Barry is a writer, director, filmmaker, marketing executive. His film credits include The Last Mogul, a 2005 documentary about producer Lou Wasserman, Oscar Peterson, Black and White, which won many awards, uh, and uh, also produced by Mark Selby. And I want to give Barry my personal thanks for the superb film, Prosecuting Evil, The Extraordinary World of Ben Ferenz, uh, which is about the exceptional life of actually a Harvard Law graduate and the longest uh, surviving prosecutor of Nuremberg trials, uh, who unfortunately passed away last year. Mark Selby, an accomplished producer of live comedy and high profile events, including the live Scotia Giller uh, Prize broadcast of the Canadian Broadcast uh, Company, and which have earned many awards, and also the special Free Up Emancipation Day 2022. Many, uh, many documentary films with Barry and others, and I bet some members of this audience want to know more about filmmaking and producing and we'll have time for many discussions and questions, but I get to start. So to start things off, um, let me ask to Barry and Mark, how'd you pick the music? <laughs> Wasn't that great? Yeah. Well, I, you, you have to start with a subject who loves music, and, and Rosalie Abella's life has been scored with music from day one. And so, again, I've, I've said this before, but I, I always saw this film as a love story, not a film about the law, and not necessarily a, about a film, a film about a Supreme Court judge, but this is a love story, uh, and uh, somebody, a story about somebody that's extraordinarily passionate, but it, and again, scored like a Broadway musical, scored <laughs> like those famous movie musicals that we all loved. This is La La Land. So uh, music, Mark and I both knew was going to be part of this from day one. You can't walk into a Rosalie Bella's office, as you saw, without being extraordinarily distracted, but still hearing uh, <laughs> music, 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 music. It scores her life, whether it's classical, whether it's Gershwin, it's there. So that was going to be it. The cutting of the opening sequence with Rhapsody in Blue, which is a favorite piece of mine that's been in my head for years, as, as Mark and I were looking at the footage that we had shot uh, under the cone of silence as, as Rosalie is walking through the hallways, I just kept thinking about those great triumphant moments in the score and, and said to Mark, let's challenge our editor to wow. open that sequence up wow. and see if that works. And, and it, you know, we looked at it before even cutting the film. Mm -hmm. We had the opening of the film and said, that's it, and, and love that. Mark, you, I'm sure you'll Well, once, well, I mean, just, just one second. Yes. I, I did not know until I saw the movie 
why the heck you were getting me to walk up and down those halls <laughs> of the Supreme Court. I kept saying, I've just, I've done it. What do you need me to walk down the hall? And then I saw a Rhapsody. And ah, it was brilliant. And well, we angle. did it at eye level. We did it from a low angle. It was, yeah, it requires a few different takes. Plus, you know, you didn't really nail it the first time. We had to get you to walk again. <laughs> to learn how to walk down the halls of my building. Uh, <laughs> no, but what actually, when we were in Rosie's office at the Supreme Court of Canada, and you see on the wall there's Broadway musical posters, there's a poster of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I mean, you see it in the film, and there's also this poster of the Gershwin brothers, and it gets you to thinking, well, we, you know, it, it turns out as we went through the, the Gershwin catalog, there's a, a perfect Gershwin, Ira Gershwin lyric for all these moments yeah. in Rosie's life. So once you start with Rhapsody in Blue, it gives you an opportunity to sort of use, to, to plumb the entire Gershwin catalog and say, oh, well, you know, their, her, her enduring marriage to Irving, Our Love is Here to Stay, When They First Meet, I've Got a Crush on You. I mean, we, there were so many songs. We actually had a long list of at least a dozen songs, which we never would have been able to afford all of them. So we picked a few highlights and moments in the film where we could, you know, um, um, uh, accentuate those moments with I, I, a, a great tune I mean, and a great singer. The beauty of this, Martha, is that I kept saying to Mark that, you know, I want to do another music documentary. I'd done David Foster a couple of years ago, and, and uh, we did Oscar Peterson. Oscar, yeah. We did not know that we'd be making another musical, <laughs> but uh, uh, law just happens to be part of it. But, so so appropriate, um, and it's a good job if you can get it, right? That's another yes, one. Yes, absolutely. Um, how did you come to make this film? Well, um, I, you know, this is some 60 docs in, uh, and uh, I, at this stage, you know, I, I want great storytelling. That's number one. Is this a great story? Are there three acts? Yes. Uh, fantastic. Uh, the, her, you know, Rosalie Bello's third act isn't even in the film yet. Uh, her third act perhaps is here and whatever else she's going to do with her life. But in Canada, uh, Supreme Court judges are not famous, uh, and in fact, Canadians, I'll be uh, controversial here in that Canadians are not great at uh, celebrating Canadians. Uh, we're just not comfortable with it. I am, but most Canadians are not. Uh, there's never been a film made about a Supreme Court judge in Canada, and there never will be again. Wow. Uh, there's no question, because there'll never be another Rosalie Bella. So uh, I, I just, you I know, when I... I think there are a lot of people who are really happy that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> this is comforting to know. No more, no, we're not going to do this Can again. I use initials? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and, and when, I, when we shot Prosecuting Evil, the Ben Ferenz film that you made reference to, and I just felt as a Canadian, even though Ben's story isn't necessarily Canadian, although certainly the Holocaust has roots to, you know, the brutal... Uh, uh, rules of the day at that time in Canada, uh, I knew I wanted a Canadian perspective mm -hmm. in the film. Uh, and, and Ben uh, was aware of Rosalie Bell. I didn't know her. Uh, but I knew I wanted, it, uh, wanted her in the film. And so when I walked into that office again and, and spent those moments mm -hmm. filming her uh, and then went back to show you and Irving, the film, alone in a hotel ballroom yeah. uh, to see it to make sure, again, that I was accurate in terms of her mm -hmm. comments, so important to me. Um, that I, It always was swimming in my head. It wasn't, we weren't ready to do this yet, but this is a story that needs to be told. And for me, um, I wasn't making this film for Canada. To me, success will be this film resonating outside of Canada. What if there's a different point of view other than what's in the United States or in Europe or Australia or wherever? What if there is a system that works? What if there's a different point of view? So success to me is if this film resonates outside of Canada and uh, we're on our way. That's the plan. Just Isabella, did anything surprise you in this film? <laughs> yes. Um, how awful I looked. No. I, <laughs> I look fabulous. I think the good. whole The whole being part of the series of interviews that, that Barry did was uh, it being inside, fish don't know that water's wet. I had no idea what was being created around me. And it was very easy for me just to talk. He had very good questions. I didn't know what they were going to be in advance. But he figured out a way to get me just to talk about whatever it was that he was interested in. And mostly, it wasn't so much about law. It wasn't until the mm -hmm. end about the cases. It's just about what life was like in the justice world. Uh, 
it was very different, I think, from what you had done before. But they made it so easy for me. And when I saw the final product, I was surprised at how well it hang, hung together, how they integrated the family, how they made it a, a story about the law. And I think what surprised me the most was what my son said. Hmm. Because we had never, you know, I never said to them, so are you happy? <laughs> Did I do OK? Did, it Did work your father out okay? do? You, you don't, you don't no. have those, mostly you don't have those kinds of conversations with your kids. So to see them, you know, one is now 50 and the other is 47, to see how secure they are mm -hmm. with having come from that home, which was not like any other home they knew. Uh, good, good people, um, good values. That was, I would say, mostly their father. <laughs> but, but it wasn't, but it was also the love they, they got for me. So mm -hmm. that was the biggest and happiest surprise to That's me. That's wonderful. Were there people interviewed that you didn't know? Most of them. I did. <laughs> there, Which prime minister? <laughs> I, I didn't know some of the younger mm -hmm. law students who were being interviewed. I didn't know the dean of Osgoode Hall mm -hmm. Law School at the time, although they, they all seemed really nice. But he, he was not accountable very to me at all. Mm. He never asked for my permission. I knew that this was a leap of faith for me, and I trusted him because he was such a brilliant filmmaker. But I never knew who he was going to interview, um, what he was going to ask them. It was, it, I was on notice. If I do this, um, which my husband really thought I should do, especially because it was Barry. Uh, because to him, to my husband, this was this was not so much a law story. It was a Canadian Jewish Holocaust story, a, a, a triumphant one. Um, but he just made this a process that was seamless, and put a film together out of out of a whole life. And I don't know how you did it. And the music, the punctuation of that music was perfect. I mean, I love the music. You know, I, I understand that it's not a law film, but there's a lot of law in this film. And it is about humanity and the law. That, to me, is a huge takeaway. Of course. Right? So I have a question about how, Mark and Barry, did you select from all of the experiences and accomplishments of Justice Isabella? Well, I, it's, it's no different and Mark, you can weigh in here. For, uh, from my end, as a filmmaker, it's no different than how do you select uh, the David Foster uh, song, uh, how, which, which of his collection of his babies, from whether it's Celine Dion, or if you like his music or you don't, but or Josh Groban, or Bocelli, uh, or Oscar Peterson's incredible uh, um, discography. Uh, this was not easy. Uh, but Mark and I always approach the film, as I do with my films, uh, from a layman's perspective of what stories and what cases and what points really I feel an audience is going gonna, is gonna to resonate with an audience. I've, I've spent a long time making films. My, uh, not that this is about me, but you know, my father, who was not a filmmaker, would take me to films uh, as a, a seven, eight, nine-year-old and say, watch the audience, not the film. Mm -hmm. Uh, watch when they squirm, watch when they, well, there are no phones then, but watch when they, they're looking around, watch when they're, you know, and you, so you find your moments, and, and we tried to select cases that uh, I thought, and we both thought, would hit a point uh, of, a, of, of, of just Sabella's career that would resonate with an audience. Not easy, um, and my deal generally with somebody who's living when I'm making a film about them, um, with the exception of those that have been in jail, uh, is to... Uh, you know, let them have one look at it without any kind of creative control or authorship to say, have I hit something? Uh, have I made a mistake? Uh, I remember sitting down with, again, David Foster, and I'm not a music expert, I'm not an expert in mixing, and, you know, and he wept after and said, great. Then you get notes, but great. Uh, <laughs> same with Ben Ferenc, and, and the same with Rosalia Bella. So 
Uh, there's a, obviously her life is again not only scored with music but law. But what has driven her? What is what was the difference? And each of those cases, we did the best. I, I don't think you watched the film when. Why that case? I mean, we, there was one case with the. I'm going to mispronounce his name. Um, the refugee. Mm -hmm. uh, Kansas Sammy. Yes, Kansas Sammy, who was who you know who we found him. Yes. Um, and and I loved that case. Yes. Uh, and wonderful. Uh, and and it, it was a great punchline to that. He said, you know, I, we're filming him and we're talking about it. And he goes, you know, I owe my life to Rosalia Bella. And this is unbelievable. And he saved my life and saved my, the whole thing. I couldn't go back to that country. It's incredible. And this whole law fascinated with me. And so I said, so is your plan to be a, a lawyer? And he goes, no, hairstylist. <laughs> I said, OK. But we, we tried to pick cases that, that we He's thought great. would hit a point. Yeah, I think Barry said it. I mean, we, you know, there were the obvious landmark cases that you know we, you want to hit. And, but you know, when we run through some of those Supreme Court highlights, they're not even necessarily the biggest cases, but they're ones that just show the breadth of Rosie's rulings, whether she was uh, ruling as part of the majority, whether there was a dissent, whether, whatever it was, just it, it was important to show the, the types of cases that the Supreme Court was hearing and what they were ruling on. And um, you know, so it, it had to do with uh, you know, whether it's uh, Kentasami, the refugee, or whether it's Uber drivers. I mean, this, these are the cases. It's, it's, it's incredible what they're asked to, uh, to hear. It's, it's all over the map. So really, it was just a, it was a cross-section of highlights from those 17 life, years the life, on yeah. the, the bench of the Supreme Court. I mean, you did a, a superb job with footage from the relevant oh, yeah. eras. Well, that's Mark. I mean, Mark, uh, who, who won who's not a visual researcher, and, and the uh, visual researchers around the world were extraordinarily annoyed that you know, he won uh, uh, the Canadian Oscar uh, two years ago for the Oscar Peterson film based on his visual research of finding footage in Denmark and Japan and Sweden that nobody had ever seen before. We just found a vault of Harry Belafonte mm -hmm. that, were, that will be our next project, most likely. Uh, and uh, Mark is a dog with a bone in finding footage, and we love going in. I mean, Rosalie Bell herself sitting there in the first, you know, and only sc private screening and saying, where did you get that? So Mark finds stuff like at nobody's business. I love it. What well, was fun watching Rosie, too, react to seeing footage that hasn't, I mean, you know, there are archives um, within Canada that are, and I'm sure the same must be the case in the United States, where they are, you know, under-resourced and underfunded, and so, and, and in fact, a lot of the TV networks just didn't even do a great job at preserving what they had because a lot of television was disposable. It was a daily talk show, so they would tape over certain things. Yeah. Uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, our public broadcaster, which is one of our main networks in Canada, is, uh, you know, like, like any American or British network, the, the, a lot of their, a lot of Canadian cultural history is lost because stuff was just erased. But they've done a great job at preserving and maintaining what they do have, and their collection is substantial. So when we started digging through their archive, and we went to a whole bunch of networks, we went to uh, Library, Library and Archives Canada, which is in Ottawa, which is the equivalent of going to the Library of Congress here and finding all this, uh, all this footage. Um, it, but, is, it is interesting, too, that, I mean, who else has home movies fleeing the Holocaust? Yeah, I, I mean, this this footage, these home movies yeah. that were mm -hmm. shot, which were incredible to get to see the again the entire arc of one's life, and also, you know, what amazed me uh, here in the film um, is joy. We've seen Holocaust stories of people coming through it and and changed for life, and who can blame them? You know, whether it's credit to uh, Rosalia Bella's parents, grandmother, uh, there is joy. You see it as a child. You see coming out of this and saying, I, I'm going to look at life for as much as I can take it, enjoy it, and fill it with music and love and family. And, and that's why I love that home movie footage. And we're so blessed to have it. Joy, that's something you don't normally see. Oh, it's simply extraordinary. Um, uh, just Isabella, I was going to ask you who have been your role models, um, judges, lawyers, others. It's hard to imagine it's not your, your family, but... Uh, I didn't have any role models in the legal community because I didn't know anything about the legal community when I was growing up. So Barry is right. It, it was a joyful family. My role models were mostly my father because I didn't 
really understand how remarkable my mother was until after my father died when I was 23. And then she stepped out from behind and showed me how, how strong she was. But he was, he was my role model. Nia uh, Bonaparte was my role model. Julius Caesar was my role model. <laughs> Fred Astaire was my role model. <laughs> but I didn't have any legal role models. There weren't any in Canada. Um, and the ones here, I knew more about the American Supreme Court and the American judges than I did about Canadian judges. I was so admiring of the Warren Court um, and Brennan and the judges who had created these, these uh, wonderful narratives about what law can and should do. And I, and I have to say, uh, that's, that's my your person. phone. That's yeah. my purse, I can't yeah. believe it. <laughs> Who's calling? Who's my son? They probably just landed at the airport. Is it JJ? No. Then you can turn it off. Okay. <laughs> can edit that out. So it's, it's been really fascinating to teach constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, last year and see this film, which was done from the perspective of how Canada understands constitutional adjudication which is the legislatures pass the law. Those laws purportedly represent the views of the majority. Checks and balances kick in with courts telling the legislature whether or not they are uh, compliant with constitutional rules, norms, whatever. And then the media, of course, steps in and mm -hmm. they, they play their role, criticizing, endorsing, whatever. But it's upside down here in this country I, the paradigm doesn't work quite as well because the court uh, has been seen as not the check and balance of rampant majority views in the interest of protecting minorities. It's more protecting minority views um, and imposing them on mm -hmm. the majority. So it's not a check on the legislatives, the legislature's role and sphere of, of um, requirement. It is an expansion of a minority position in a way that Canada would never do. And so, I mean, it's, it's confusing if you're a law student to, to say, uh, my role is to protect the minority. But if the minority is a view that is harmful to other minorities or to the majority, the way it seems to be increasingly here, where you are now in a sclerotic rights environment, watching a film about an expansive rights environment. So we're all, they're nine judges, we're nine judges, and we just see our roles so differently. And I feel it more strongly sitting in this room um, than I did when I saw it in Canada. And having you and Margie Marshall uh, Ron Daniels, who is bi-coastal because he's Canadian, but he's also now president of an American university, um, is so wonderful for me to know that there is, there is a similar soulmate view among Americans, and this audience is, is full of professors and students who feel that way too. But I don't know how you would frame a movie about an American Supreme Court judge today um, who, if they said the things that I said, would be seen as being tyrannical in imposing my religious views on everybody else. It's that was our title originally. Imposing tyrannical views? Yes. <laughs> Sula didn't fit on the poster. Yeah. You know, I, we can have a longer discussion another time if we have a number of justices appointed by presidents who didn't get a majority vote, uh, confirmed by senators, representing less than half of the population because of the way our Senate works. I don't know who is representing. Um, but I, maybe this is a good segue to ask the question about disagreement. Uh, the film doesn't show a lot about disagreement, but the court has disagreement. It had disagreement when you were there. It has disagreements now. Um, I just wonder how you reflect on that uh, you're you're cordial, but you're not. You don't withhold your view. And for people who want to understand um, 
you pointed to your majority and your dissents. The dissents take as much time as the majority. How does disagreement work in the court, and is this something that you you worried about in the film? Well, I, I can only answer one part of that, obviously. I'm not going to answer what happens in a court, although I, I could. Do you want me to try that? Sure. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Let me I, film it, you while you're saying <laughs> I, I will say it was interesting. People said, you know, where were the naysayers in the film? Where are the people that hate Abella? Um, and we were at a... Mark and I were at an event in Ottawa um, for, you made reference, the television show we produce, which is uh, the, like the Booker Prize, but the Giller Prize. And uh, a gentleman came up to me, and uh, a well-known journalist, and read me a riot act about Abella. You, you know? didn't tell me that. Uh, uh, and, and, Who you know, was it? <laughs> and said, well, I'll tell you later. Oh. And, said, uh, <laughs> and said, you know, what are you doing? You know, she's basically a communist, and she's this and that, and outrageous, and she's, you know, she's turned back the country 100 years, and on and on and on and on. And, and, I, and I said to him, uh, Jeffrey, uh, let, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I said, you know, um, fabulous. You know, I'll have a film crew at your house tomorrow. Let's go. I said, I know that, and... and Rosie's tough enough that, you know, and, my, and I've always said with my documentaries, I'll, I'll show both views. I let, I'm not Michael Moore, who I hate. Let's let the audience decide, okay? You make up your own. So if there's going to be some negativity in there, and like a classic Canadian, he said yes and then canceled, you know, and then we ran into somebody else, you know, oh, God, you know, another journalist, or, or not another journalist, but another sort of activist, Romain Nameless, and I said, you know, same thing, e vicious email, and I said to him, then... Come on camera, let's go. Here's your view, let's go. No. So it's classic Canadian stuff. You're not just not gonna get we, that. We here were still able to work the journalist into the film by showing some of his bylines mm -hmm. and uh, And his headlines. articles. Yeah. Yes. Uh, coward. <laughs> no, he wasn't a coward in print. So all of these, <laughs> all of these criticisms were very public. I mean, there, there was, I, I wasn't kidding when I said in the movie that I don't think I remember another Canadian Supreme Court judge yeah. who'd attracted that kind of um, acrimony Flack. from yeah. Yeah. Um And there were headlines in uh, two of the newspapers: "Fire this judge," "Rescind this appointment." They were there were protests. They were there were protests. So I thought, you know, I got so used to it, and now it's interesting when I hear you say this now. Aside from the fact that I want the phone number of the person who told that to you, it doesn't rankle anymore. It doesn't, about five years into the Supreme Court, it just didn't, didn't bother me anymore. And it was. But did you, did you have, um, to uh, Dean Minow's questions, if that's the right title, forgive me. Uh, it sounds good. Answer anything. Um, did, but did, did you ever feel in, in, uh, when decisions were being written and you were meeting in, in that, with that group, were any of them trying to censor you and push you? Oh, and no. No, no. I mean, we, this comes back to your question. So the criticism was outside in the press until about 2000. Well, the country changed. I mean, we didn't have... George Bush anymore. We didn't have Margaret Thatcher anymore. Uh, in Canada, we never had a very conservative government. Um, we had Stephen Harper, who, but I was already on the court, so there was nothing that could be done. But everything was public. Inside the court, until the last four or five right. years, I would say, to be honest, in the privacy of this room, which is being taped, <laughs> uh, I would go to court when we had very important cases and say to my husband, I have no idea what we're going to do with this case. And I really, I didn't. I didn't know how gay marriage was going to come out. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how assisted dying was going to come out because I didn't know what was going to happen when we were in the room together, the nine of us, talking about what, what to do about the case. And I was always um, pleasantly surprised at how much deliberation there was. like we, And we changed the system. It used to be the American mm -hmm. system, but reversed. The junior judge spoke, and then the next junior judge, and mm -hmm. until you, an hour later, you get to the chief justice. And by then, you're falling asleep, and there's no exchange, and, mm -hmm. and it's a serial monologue, and it's not productive. 
So we changed it after a couple of years. I remember meeting Aaron Barak at a conference and mm -hmm. saying, so how do you guys discuss cases? When you, do you have it one after another? He said, are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, we just talk and we, we debate. So we changed it at the Supreme Court to become more, more simultaneously deliberative, which was a culture change. But it worked really well. People tended to be very open. Um, so we knew who was the majority. We knew if we were possibly going to be unanimous. And we knew if there was going to be a dissent. But then the judgments circulated, and people would mm -hmm. change their minds or would go and come into your office and say, you know, if you take this paragraph out or if you add this, maybe, maybe I'll go along. All of that was very possible. So you would listen to outside opinions. You might amend. Oh, all the time. All the time. We all did. Now, I wasn't a memo writer because I can't use a computer, and it takes so long. So I would go into their office and, and just say, and they would come into mine and say, um, what about just this? Talk, mm -hmm. talk about it. And nine times out of 10, come up with a solution we could both live with. Because you have to, be, you have to live, be able to live with it because your name's on it. The last few years, and I'm telling you nothing that will be a surprise to the Canadians in the room who reads the Supreme Court of Canada cases, um, we, we got something that we had never had before mm -hmm. on our court. Uh, but you have had much experience with on your American Supreme Court. We got people who would be considered, um, so you can lean left, you can lean right, you can be center. We had never had ideologues. And what do I mean by an ideologue? I mean that if this is your brain, that uh, if you are an open-minded person, what you hear may change that shape. If you are an ideologue and there's a difference, then it doesn't matter what you hear, it will take the shape of your brain. Uh -huh. And I had never met before in a collegial environment people who would not change their minds. Mm -hmm. And there is not a whole lot, you, they may change a word, they may change a mm -hmm. sentence, uh, but there's not a whole lot you can do. And then the tone started to change on our court and there were some unpleasant, um, adjectives hurled around that were, that made the rest of us very uncomfortable, but you can't, can't tell somebody what they can write. So the atmosphere on the court did change. We got to, we got to have blocks, mm -hmm. which we had never had before. Mm -hmm. So it was evolutionary, maybe inevitably, that it was a halcyon period from mm -hmm. 1982 when we started the Charter of Rights and Freedoms until the last few years, but to be honest, it's still a very good court. Yep. Most of the decisions are um, uh, solid majorities, and I, mm -hmm. they are nowhere near being in a state of distress that, that worries me. Do well, you miss the action? No. Nope. I'm, I'm at the Harvard Law School. <laughs> what are you talking about? It doesn't get better. That's true. Drain food than this place. I love the people here. I feel more at home here than I did at the court in the last few years. Wow. Um, that is being taped. And now, it's going on a card on a home. It's going on a t-shirt. <laughs> Legally brunette, and she loves Harvard. So. <laughs> I'm going to turn to uh, you assembled people here in a minute, but I have a last question, which is what are your plans for the film, and what do you hope its takeaway will be for people? Well, uh, you know the the plans. I'm I don't I'm not a filmmaker who you know is hoping the tree falls in the forest. Somebody hears it. We're you know we are uh, aggressively uh, marketing the film and and, uh, and you know thankfully we've had and Rosie gets very excited every time I tell her this. I mean we you know we're we're had a phenomenal response from film festivals around the world. Another invitation every week, and so that's great. And we're in negotiations with. Uh, an American broadcasting entity that's interested in it, uh, and uh, that's success. I mean, Mark and I are of no um, illusion, disillusion that you know, sudden that uh, a, a Netflix or somebody is going to say, "Hey, given what they've become uh, and how they're buying films and what they're streaming today, is going to be interested in this film." Uh, but uh, everyone's going to look at it. We'll make sure of that. So it will find a home in the United States. We're already finding. Uh, 
uh, interesting homes for it all over the world, and that's great. But again, if, we, if I can go law school to law school, yeah. if this becomes essential viewing, and we're, we're getting those invitations all over the place now, then that's fantastic. It, it's the same thing with Prosecuting Evil, Ben Ferencz. Mm -hmm. Yes, Netflix picked it up, uh, uh, but to me, success was, and we made the film available to you know, high schools, universities around the world to watch. Same thing here. You know, we will, this, will, this is a, a labor of love for both of us, and we'll make sure that this film gets seen by uh, as many people as possible. Great. And I think also worth mentioning that it, has, it will air in prime time on Canadian television in February. So this film will, will be on a prime time broadcast network, which is not it's something you could say for no. documentary films in the United States. So we're thrilled with that, that it's going to be on a Sunday night at 8 p.m. It's you know, wow. great timing. And in the winter. No one wants to be outdoors in the winter. <laughs> so, uh, not in Toronto. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we're thrilled that you know, people in Canada will have the chance to watch it that night, to stream it afterwards, and hoping that uh, viewers in the U.S. and internationally will have the same opportunity soon as well. It's fantastic. Questions, comments? Yes. Um, Please say who you are. Here comes a microphone. It's like Phil Donahue. Here we go. Hi, I'm a friend of Rosie Abella's. Okay. Um, that was a great question. My name's Diane Kahn. And hold it. Um, Rosie, the, the decision about the right to die, could you talk a little about that? Because it was considered such a landmark and still is. And I, th I think it was a majority, I mean, was it a 9 nothing decision? At the, and, and how would that have changed since then, as in your sort of thinking? So it was, that was a, an interesting byplay between Parliament and the court. We had, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada had rendered a decision 25 years before uh, saying you could not, the, the criminal code provision which uh, made it against the law, criminal offense to assist somebody to commit suicide. In a decision about a woman named Suze, uh, Sue Rodriguez who had ALS, mm. couldn't feed herself, couldn't couldn't manage on her own, wanted to be able to die, went to the court and the Supreme Court said, you can't. Uh, it, it, it is constitutionally OK to prevent people from doing it. So 25 years later, with a very healthy chunk of the jurisprudence of the, of the decision explaining when the court will change its precedent, because you don't want to create the perception that just because the constitution of the court changes, they'll change the law because they can. Not that courts do that, but in case they do. So we had we set out our template. Have the, have the circumstances changed? Uh, are there new facts? Have, have attitudes changed enough about something that is very controversial? And we... I don't think we've ever worked harder on a decision. We were in each other's offices mm -hmm. a lot. There were, the court had some very um, decent people with serious concerns, religious concerns, moral concerns, all legitimate. The fact that we were able to work that out and write mm -hmm. not just a unanimous opinion, yeah. it was by the court. Yeah. So there was no, no signature, no author on it. It was done by the court. The reaction on the part of the public was interesting. Um, I think the politicians got a bit nervous and brought in legislation. We had said intolerable suffering. They brought in legislation saying terminal illness. We had concluded inside, because they had argued, if you're going to do it, only if it's a terminal in illness. We had decided everybody's terminal. So how are you, how are you going to decide that it's a terminal illness? Yeah. The government changed the legislation to, to make the threshold higher than we had made it. Mm. Uh, that's still kind of playing out. Quebec right. did its own thing right. and adopted the court's decision. But it left us in an interesting position, which was, what would we do if someone brought a case to the Supreme Court of Canada saying, the government is not applying your jurisprudence um, without using the notwithstanding clause, which gives them the right to say, I don't care what the decision says, 
we're not going to follow it. So it just, it's still lingering. People are getting medically assisted suicide across Canada. Um, it's become more and more accepted. I think people will always be legitimately concerned about uh, its being available in a way that makes it cavalier. Right. But most people who, who have mm -hmm. availed themselves of that right do it to protect their dignity so that they can die with dignity. And that was the key to our judgment. How can you keep someone in pain or miserably suffering? Who are you to say that your right to protect their uh, moral standing in the universe is more important than their right to say, I can't take this anymore. I can't do it. So uh, to me, it was the court at its best. It was the, when I was on it. I mean, the same-sex marriage was also mm -hmm. by the court, no author. And that was, that was differently interesting. But we had, by the time we did it, just so you know, that we weren't fantastic heroes when we did it, seven of the 10 provinces or eight had already decided that gay marriage was legal. So we were crashing through open doors when we did that. Um, and the, the gay marriage case was also, a, a uh, it had public approval. It was wonderful to see Mansbridge mm -hmm. saying, we've been struggling with this in Canada for months, months. And in the <laughs> United States, it's something that had been going on for years and years. So the revolution in Canada, 1992. I'll turn it off. <laughs> a decision, uh, thank you. A decision of the Court of Appeal saying section 15, the equality section includes sexual orientation. We wrote it into the constitution, just imagine. We also wrote in marital status. We wrote in analogous grounds, that's 1992. 1995, they didn't talk about it because I don't think there was a way to put it in a film. I wrote a decision on the Court of Appeal, a majority decision, saying that the criminal code provision which um, penalized anal intercourse for 14 to 18 year olds by 10 years imprisonment was unconstitutional. It was hugely controversial because it was about teenagers, hugely controversial. Remember people saying to me, Rosie, you have sons, how can you do What has that got to do with anything? Three years later, and the press was full of a Bella Wright's terrible decisions yeah. allowing young people to do things, even though you could have what we call heterosexual sex at 14 to 18 mm -hmm. and no consequences. And then in 1998, the Rosenberg decision about spousal benefits, no controversy. This time they said, a court of appeal does good decision. So when it was a bad decision, it was a Bella's decision. When it was a good decision, it was Court of Appeal decides pension benefits, good decision. And then family law came through. And then 2004, my first case on the Supreme Court of Canada, 12 years from that first decision, done. Same-sex marriage. And the other difference between us and the United States is when things are done in Canada, they're done. The waters close. We did abortion in 1989. That was the end of that conversation. We did um, same-sex marriage. Nobody talks about that anymore. Hate speech. So you yeah. hate speech. Here, things seem to linger and linger and linger for a, a long time. Anyway, I can't remember uh, why I got off on this rant, uh, but the but the assisted <laughs> the assisted dying case yeah. I thought was an apotheosis for collegial decision making in the public interest at its best. That's wonderful. There are questions. There's a mic coming, Bob, and just say who you are. Bob Manukin, just now you speak, yeah. Uh, Rosie, uh, I'd love for you to share your thoughts about what's going on with the Supreme Court in Israel and the political controversy there. Might have to repeat it. Been on committees like so. sure. related to Israel. So the question was, what's, how do I feel about what's going on in Israel on the Israeli Supreme Court? Uh, so let me give you a preface to that. 
Bob and I are on something called the Israel Democracy Institute Board, which has been committed to examining, protecting, and ensuring the ongoing viability of democratic institutions in Israel, including the judiciary. Uh, and part of that, for me anyway, was talking about Israel to students, to Jewish students, who were from time to time worried about who the government was in Israel. I'm not talking about this current government. I'm going to carve that out. And saying Israel has some terrible policies, Israel is, is terrible, and saying to them, look, uh, the United States had some leadership issues, but nobody ever said, let's get rid of the United States, or let's boycott the American professors, or let's boycott American goods. So there is, there was something about how Israel was targeted and singularly treated that made me very uncomfortable. What is happening now to the Israeli Supreme Court? And take the, the case before the Supreme Court now is, is reasonableness review constitutional. Uh, they haven't yet dealt with the appointment process where they're trying to politicize the appointment process and make the majority of the decision makers who pick the judges of the Supreme Court politicians. Um, I think Israel's very democratic heart is at stake in this war between very conservative, very religious, very intolerant forces in Israel. And what I see as this, the core of the country reflected in the 1948 Declaration of Independence. And the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of people marching every single week in Israel on behalf of their Supreme Court, something I don't think we will ever see in any democracy in the Western world, gives me hope that this is still Israel's core. That there are flaws, uh, that there are problems. We have to, you have to address the fact that there are settlements that are creating a problem. How to deal with the Palestinians, definitely a problem. That's not this particular conversation. This conversation is the risk to Israel's viability as, as the strong democracy in the Middle East, continuing if there is an ongoing assault um, by the religious right and by the right against what has made the Israel judiciary the envy of the world. I mean, we, we've been citing the Israeli Supreme Court for years, uh, and will continue to. But if they take away the, the ability to appoint those great judges, their current Chief Justice, Esti Hayut, who retires in two or three weeks, was a hero. Unbelievable dignity in the face of personal onsl onslaughts, vituperative newspaper comments. I mean, that to me, the grace under pressure exhibited by those judges makes me even angrier about what is happening in Israel. So it makes me very sad and very nervous. And I think partly it's because, and now here's a segue, I think you can be too tolerant of people who are different from you and are too willing to ignore how destructive they can be. So for years, there was a risk in Israel of the pressure from the Haredim and the, and the hard right religious people. And it was, well, they're different, but they're part of the country, which of course is true. But instead of insisting on protecting the hegemonic democratic functions of Israel, I think too much leeway was given to the possibility that they had an equal point of view. Well, it's not equal when you're not letting women get an education, work, ride on a bus with you. That's not, it's not democracy. But people weren't calling them out because, you know, we have to all kind of get along. So I think there's a metaphor here for us too in what's going on in Israel. We tolerated too much, too long, and they won. I mean, it's what I call the Chamberlain syndrome. Well, and 
toleration of intolerance. Toleration of intolerance. So let's just take two more. Two more comments. Uh, one that I, I guess I have, which is, how long did it take to make this film? Normally, our trajectory on a documentary is we're always working on a lot, a lot at the same time. It's about eight months or so. This was longer in that we were filming during COVID. When we filmed Justice Abella uh, in, in the Supreme Court, it, the building was essentially shut down. I mean, we're going in under the cloak of darkness. Uh, <laughs> with equipment hidden in coats and whatnot for various reasons. But uh, um, so that was tough and based on Justice Isabella's uh, schedule and, and, uh, and other pieces that we needed. And, and then, you know, we were in post-production when uh, Irving Abella, her husband, passed away. Uh, remember getting that call when up with our... our uh, executive producer is here, Jonas Prince, up with him. Johnny, uh, stand yeah. up. You're the executive producer, Johnny Prince. Uh, well, I had the great fortune of making a couple of documentaries, including an unlikely obsession about Winston Churchill based on Martin Gilbert's book, Churchill and the Jews. But uh, we got that call, and you know, as a filmmaker, what's going through your mind is how does this fit in the story, and and uh, and you know, and would. Rosie sit down and talk about that but but and and I knew you know you have to be respectful and give her the distance that's needed here but you know I, I was going to certainly try as much as I could to convince her uh, uh, because again we always saw the film as a love story so how do you you could simply put up a card that says you know Irving Abella yeah. passed away the headlines that were there internationally um, and I mean you can continue with that story but we you know we we uh, left her alone for some time uh, and then hoped, I didn't ask, but then hoped that she might want to do it. And, and uh, not only as a legacy for her grandchildren, but, but for you know, part of the story, critical. I didn't want to do it. There it is. I, I did not want to talk about him at all. I couldn't. Um, and Barry let it go and then called it very tentative and very respectfully called again. And in the end, it was my sons who said, you really, you really have to. But when I saw myself in that white blouse, trying to get up the energy to talk Call about these cases, because mm -hmm. I, because Barry said, and while we're at it, can we talk <laughs> about Cantha Sammy and, and Saskatchewan Federation of Labor? <laughs> um, but I'm glad, I'm glad that he mm -hmm. stayed the course and asked me. I think for, for you know, anybody going through the process of grieving. Uh, I wanted that yeah. in the film. How do you deal with that after spending an entire life with someone that you've defined them, they've defined you? You know, I wanted that perspective selfishly. Curious, I was curious, uh, and uh, and I thought it'd be important for the audience. So I bless you for doing it. Yeah. No, with, I give you my thanks for your doing it, and your thanks for your persistence. Difficult as it is, it's part of the story and part of the love. So, so the, short, the short answer is uh, Rosie left the court in the summer of 2021. We were there, what, 10 days before your final day. So that was when we, that was our first day of shooting and the film premiered May 1st at the Hot Docs Festival in Toronto. So mm -hmm. it was almost two years in the making. Which is unusual for me. So I, there's one tiny addendum that I wonder if you'll make a sequel, which is there was a case that your court decided about whether someone who was not born in Canada could practice law. Right. What was the decision, and how did that matter to you? Um, so you know from the movie that I decided to become a lawyer when I was four, when, I, uh, when my father went to the Law Society of Upper Canada a few days after we came to Canada, and he knew English because he'd worked for the Americans whom he loved. And we used to debate, I said, why aren't we in New York? What am I doing in Toronto? When, <laughs> when you love the Americans, they loved you. We could have been right next door to Broadway. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this story about how you had to be a citizen, which he never complained about, was on my mind. And I was, I was going to be the revenge. I was going to do what he couldn't do. He died a month before I finished law school. That wasn't in the movie. 
Um, he died of cancer. He got sick a few months after I got married. Itchy was amazing. He just, he, I went from law school to my mm. father's house every day. Itchy picked me up at 10.30. We were newlyweds. He was so, so good about it. Um, and he died a month before, and I never went to my graduation. I just couldn't stand the idea of going if he wasn't going to be able to be there. The very first decision that the Supreme Court of Canada decided on what equality means in 1989 was a case called Andrews. Um, I was, at the time, the chair of the Law Reform Commission, but the Royal Commission report had come out in 1984. And it was the first time that the court was having to think about what does equality mean in Canada. We, like, we, we had only the 14th Amendment jurisprudence to look to. Germany didn't have jurisprudence. Nobody had jurisprudence. They took the Royal Commission report language about what equality means and what discrimination means to strike down a citizenship requirement for a lawyer in British Columbia who wanted to practice law but couldn't because he wasn't a citizen. So they used my words mm -hmm. to strike down the provision that had kept my father from practicing law. And it was, you know, it was a gift for his, how do you know, how can you plan? Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to put it on his grave and say, we fixed it. It's, <laughs> it's going to be OK now. But see, if, if I had listened to people, I would never have done that Royal Commission, because they said, you're going to get into trouble hmm. for this Royal Commission. Nobody wants affirmative action in Canada. And I did. Hmm. But I also was able to think about equality in a way that, that was helpful. Well, I have to say to Barry and Mark, thank you for this brilliant, beautiful film. And thank you, Justice Abello, for being willing to be the subject of it. And to Harvard Law School, you now know where I was coming from when I came here. And you scooped me up, and you taught me how to walk again. And I will always be grateful for the, the way my brain has soared here from what I've learned and the way you filled my heart with friendship and love. So thank you, Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm.